and welcome to Off Track, powered by Rich Energy. I'm your host, Dave Neal, and I'm absolutely delighted to say that joining us this afternoon, <laughs> TT is chuckling away already. No, TT Plus not. presenter, podcast host, former Commonwealth cyclist, former motorcycle racer. What have I missed? Anything else? Chris Pritchard, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me, first and foremost. You're very welcome. I'm a little bit jaded, but this is going to get me warmed up for what I've got to do for my work later on. I don't mind being your warm-up tactic. <laughs> I don't mind being your warm-up tactic. I'm a fluffer. So you've got to go down to the fan park in a bit and do a few bits. But before then, let's talk about you. Let's make it about you for oh, a change. Don't, please. Because you do all the stuff that it's about other people. Let's sit here and talk about you for a bit. I mean, I do enjoy the subject. It's, it's a good subject, but I don't often talk about myself. I always like to talk about other people. Show me one sportsman that doesn't like talking about themselves. True, very true, yeah. It's that kind of business, isn't it? Yeah, but at the you same kind of, time... Especially subject. Yeah, but, I mean, I'd probably talk about myself if I'd come back with medals from the Commonwealth Games, if I'd gone to BSB and done well in, in motorcycle racing, I'd probably talk about myself. But I look at it and I go, well, it's all right. It's, it's more all right. Than all right. No, I know, but it's more than, it's more than I've everyone done. says that. And one day, maybe I'll get to the point where I go, "Oh, actually, that was that was pretty good." But a, a, I guess it's a, a lot of my friends just take the piss out of me because I didn't come back with a gold medal. Someone w wrote on the on my Wikipedia page that I somehow have that I won a medal at the Commonwealth Games. So everyone says congratulations, and I'm like, I never won a medal. I don't know where this information came from, but I'm taking it. You won a heart. I did. Well, I won it for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll leave that one there leave that one there <laughs> <laughs> how life changes eh doesn't it just how life changes anyway sorry. anyway let's move on chris Pritchard, <laughs> welcome to off track mate it's Thank a pleasure you. to have you here how let's go back into your background first yes as a, a motorcycle racer first commonwealth level pro cyclist as well yeah i mean that that's two incredible disciplines to be pretty good at to be fair yeah i, I would I never intended on doing the cycling thing. I love cycling. I rode a bike as a kid, but the only reason I rode the bike was so I could pretend to be Kevin Schwantz and the guys that raced the 500cc. So my dad used to race motorbikes when he was younger, but it was like the, 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 the lowest of low levels. It was proper. We had a little Ford Fiesta. He had this shitty homemade trailer that he used to take his RD250 on and we'd go to Mallory Park, Donington Park. And I just used to love it. It was like the dream. My mum hated it. I absolutely loved it, especially Mar Mallory Park, because the paddock is inside. Yeah. Once you're there, you're there for the day. And my dad would have like one race at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, and then that would be it. We'd have to sit and wait till the whole racing had finished, so we'd always go and watch the racing. So that's where I got the love of motorbikes from. So I started riding pedal bikes to do that. And then I, d I, d I don't know how I was going to do it, but I always said I'm going to be a professional motorcyclist. Even when I was 16, 17, like guys in Spain now, they're eight years old and they're professionals. They, they're getting ready to go through. And at 16, never really raced a bike in my life. Could not afford to race a bike, but I was like, I'm going to be a professional motorcyclist. I go into the careers office to say, right, Chris, GCSEs are coming up. What are you going to do after school? I don't know, race motorbikes. They were like, how are you going to do that? No idea. <laughs> but got a job in a motorcycle shop, got myself into a shit ton of debt, race motorbikes. So technically, you know, I did, I did achieve the goal of racing motorbikes. So I bought, I, I actually bought James Toseland's old motocross bike, turned it into a supermoto bike and went supermoto racing because it was the cheapest form of racing. Uh, yeah. And I absolutely loved it. It was, it was unbelievable. I, I was actually telling someone the story about it because I think, if I remember rightly, Dave Jeffries was in the race. My first ever race, Cadwell Park. They used part of the circuit, but not all of it. So it was down into turn one, up round Charlie's, one and two, down the back straight, halfway down the back straight. There's a service road for the marshals. They didn't use that. We went a little bit further and then they just cut straight across the grass. And the grass is like off cambered like this. So you, you approach it like this and I know people can't see it on the audio, but it goes against where you want to go. So it's off camber. Pissed it down with rain. First race, I'm probably like 20th. 15 people all hit the grass and just went straight down. I somehow managed to stay up. I was in the lead of my first race and I'm riding around on the first lap thinking, I'm going to win my first race. This is easy. <laughs> Come around the second time, straight down. Fuck. Pick it up, go around, second lap, uh, third lap, down again. Fourth lap, down again. It was just horrendous. It was a horrible experience, but that was it. I was, I was off to the races and I started. And I did all right, to be fair, to say I had no motocross experience, which is what everybody else had. They had so much more motocross experience than I did, like Christian Idden, Matt Wynn Stanley. Um, the old, the old guys. One of the John McGuinness's old mechanics, Leighton Haig, He used to. He was like, I think he was British champion while I was racing. Scunthorpe's finest. 
Yeah, yeah. And um, I did all right and started progressing. Then I bought a Hoosberg 550 off a guy called Mick. I can't remember his surname. But he ran Sam Warren's team. I don't know if you remember Sam Warren, yeah. but he moved into British Superbikes eventually. But Sam was a phenomenal rider. And they said to me one day, come to Lad Landudno for the British Championship. So we were riding Nora, which was like the national level, but we were at ACU British level championships. And it was just, I was so out of my depth. I wasn't going to say no because I wanted to progress, but we got to the point in Landudno where there was a proper off-road section, massive tabletop, probably the length of this place. And the motocross guys and all the proper supermoto guys were just boop, up and over it. And I was up to the top, right along the top of it, and then down into this whoop section, literally on every single whoop up and down, up and down. That's like me going around my local pump track on my little <laughs> yeah, track. Exactly. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just riding it just all riding the time. It. They're, they're just like bop, 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 no bop, bop, over the top of it all. But then get on the road, and I don't want to blow me on trumpet. Do it. That's what the podcast but for. I, I was I was there. I was, I was as fast as everybody else. So I knew I was... I know I had enough, but just the, the motocross side of it and the off-road side didn't really translate for me. Different disciplines, yeah. I completely. But I knew I wanted to go into to, to road racing. So eventually, after a couple of years of supermoto, I sold that, bought a cheap S-Rad, which I've still got to this day, 1999. My dad was out on it last year. My dad's like 65, and he was taking it around Darley Moor. So I think I'm, I'm going to get it back out. But um, I got it, bought it, bought the van, wrote my check for my race entries. So back in the day, people used to enter via check. So you used to have to write people, a check. People remember what checks Remember were. a check? <laughs> the, young, the young guys <laughs> are like, what? He definitely does. Yeah. He's shaking his head, but you know but he does. It was like two grand's worth of checks I'd wrote out. And I looked at it and I was like, I only earn like 125 quid a week at this point. I'm like, that doesn't add up. I'm not going to be able to afford this. And it was that moment I was like, well, I can't do it anymore. So I'd done a few track days, realized I was quick enough to be national level, but just couldn't do anything. I had no money, no support, and that was it. The bike just sat in the garage, and, and I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I was still competitive, and I'm really competitive. And I just started cycling a little bit to, to keep fit for motorcycling. I thought, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll start cycling. So I went and started road racing, and that's, how I, that's where my cycling career took off. And, and again, it was, sorry, no, it okay. was... Um, it, it just went from zero to 100 like that. Road race for two years on the roads, bored as hell of that. I just, I have no attention span whatsoever. So I'd sit in the group. Uh, if anybody knows cycling, you know, it's, the races are anywhere between an hour and three, four hours, like 80 mile races. And I'd sit there in the group and I'd just be like so bored out of my head. So I'd attack because there's nothing else to do. But what I realize is I'm no good at attacking and staying away. I'm a really good sprinter but I'm not good at attacking. So I'd attack, get bored, get tired, drop back, and then eventually get spat out the back, and that would be the end of my race. But eventually, once I learned that I was good at sprinting, I'd stay in the pack, wait for my chance, boom, and I'd normally win the race. So I think my second or third race, I won, and then it just, I just kept winning and winning and winning, and then I went, that's when I went to the velodrome, because I knew I had a bit of a sprint on me. So I went to the velodrome within... It was a, it was a very bizarre experience, because within probably six months of turning up to the track, I'd been selected for Scotland for the Commonwealth Games. Um, a guy called Shane Sutton, one of the best coaches, a lot of people probably know him. He's been in the papers for one or two things he said and did. That he definitely said and did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we'll leave that one there. Uh, got, he was a, he was a, uh, that's why they won so many gold medals, because he was so hard and he was so ruthless. So I understand why he did it, but Anyway, that's a different story. But he just happened to spot me on, a, on a, um, a, pri a, a public session. So I was there just training away on a public session, and he comes into the center of the track, and he says to someone, who's that up there? And he's like, oh, it's Chris. He does a bit of sprinting. And he's like, all oh, right, come off the track. Someone mentions it to me. So I go over to Shane, and, I'm, and I just introduce myself. It'd be great to come and train with you guys sometime. This is, I'm like 25 at this point. So I'm, I'm old. I'm it's old as hell. It's a relatively start, isn't it? Yeah, Jason Kenny's probably won three or four gold medals by them. So he said, come down to the track and train with us. So I went down to the track, trained for the first session. So I'm there with literally just like we are here. So Chris Hoy, Victoria Pendleton, Jason Kenny, Ed Clancy, Andy Tennant, like all the big ones. And I'm just sat there like, how, what, how? So I'm, I think this is it. I, this, this was my destiny, whatever. I, this is what I was supposed to do. So I jumped on track and I was, again, I was, for the lack of experience I had, I was really good on it. But their level was... They're world class. They're, they are the best in the world. That's like, 
jumping on the Isle of Man and expecting to compete with Dean Harrison and Peter Hickman after coming here once. So it was like a massive level. I'd gone from beating everybody who was, with all due respect, nobody, to then racing against these boys, and I was just absolutely nowhere. But I, I plugged away at it and tried my best, and ultimately they decided I was too old and too slow. That's what Shane said. That's it. I remember the phone call when he said, we're not taking you any further because you're too old and you're too slow. It was horrible. So where, where do you, so obviously the aggregation of marginal gains didn't work there, did it? Clearly not, no. But it's funny though, because Dave Brailsford came into the track center and he said to me, we had a quick chat. I, I told him about my motorbike experience and whatnot. And he said, I think you've got a lot of headroom. And that's how they'd explain it, how far you could potentially go. You've, you, you know, you've not reached your ceiling. So it was like, we'll keep an eye on you and we'll, we'll, we'll see how far you can go with it. But yeah, train for six months and then beat a couple of the guys on this, that had been on the squad already at nationals. And I thought I'd, I'd done enough, and I was. We'd set, all the guys were sat there waiting to get this letter or phone call to say whether we were going to take you on for the following year. That was 2011. So if you're there, there's a good chance you're going to be going to London, or you're in with a shot of London. So I was like fully expecting this is it. I'd quit my job because I was so adamant that I was going to go to the Olympic Games or at least be in with a chance of it. I'd quit my job as a personal trainer so I could concentrate solely on cycling. And then to get that phone call and say, yeah, you're not good enough. It was. It was, yeah. I'm still bitter about it today. I'm breathe, st breathe. I'm still bitter about it today. <laughs> because it well, could have gone. That's understandable because that's just the most. To be on the precipice of something like that, the Commonwealth yeah. Games are fantastic level. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. that. But the Olympics are the pinnacle. It doesn't get any better. It, it's, it's, it's the Manx and the TT itself, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. In that comparison. Yeah. Um, to do the Manx is great, to do the TT is the pinnacle mm -hmm. and line up with the guys. But the, the names that you that you gave then to be sat around, I can't even begin to imagine what it must have felt like to see those names and those people sat around and to be as your peers at that point. Absolutely bizarre. And I remember we, we were riding around the track and Vicky came up to me and she introduced herself and said hello. And um, I told her how I'd got on, onto the squad. And she was like, if you're in with Shane, you're safe. You know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll do all right here. Obviously not ro well enough. But yeah, to have Vicky Pendleton riding there, to be sat in a line with Chris Hoy, to, to have raced with Chris a couple of times, it's just, yeah, it is, it is pretty amazing. People yeah. can't take that away from you. That's no, I the, that's not. a good thing. I mean, I, I, have a, I have a love for anything two wheels. So when I was a kid, I used to do time trialing and things like that. Yeah. My times don't matter before you ask. <laughs> I hate were, time trialing anyway, they, so they were all right. <laughs> faster than mine. I, I could do a sub 30 minute 10, so that was fine by me. That's, that's enough. I, I'd, I'd take that. Yeah. And when you look at the, the profile of cycling that's come on since, and, and I'm going back to sort of late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. Tony Doyle, Joey McLaughlin, people like yeah. that, it was still a really niche sport. But for the likes of yourself with the Commonwealth Games and Chris Hoy and Jason Kenny and, and people like that, British cycling's at the fore, and you were part of that. Yeah, to a degree, yeah. Yeah, I, d I never felt like I was fully integrated because I never got the, to the point where they were paying me to do it. It was I was still kind of, you know, doing it myself off my own back. Um, so then I was, af after they'd said no, I was on a vendetta then. I was like, shut the fuck up. I'm fast enough and I'll prove that. So I went and told the guys at Scotland, listen, my mum's Scottish. I'm all right on a bike. I'd love to uh, represent Scotland. So they were like, we'll keep an eye on you. And then a month later or two months later after nationals, that's when I got selected, went to Delhi. I mean, it did help that it was in Delhi because no one wanted to go to Delhi. <laughs> it was horrendous. It was a great experience, but it was horrendous. It was like, yeah, I, I don't know if you remember the stories, but none of the uh, athletes' village was finished. There was, I think there was a story about 5,000 condoms blocking the, uh, the sewers up during it. It was like brown water when you turned the taps on. You were getting covered in brown water when you were having a shower. I think there was all sorts of algae and shit in the swimming pool. I think at one point, was there a crane that went through the roof of the velodrome as well? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was Jeez. India. We, we experienced it. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. We did shit, but it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And again, something that you can't take away from, from someone. But Absolutely. Again, it would have been nice to have a medal. I, 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 it's I, like, I can feel that. Then you can go home and you can go, it was worth it. Something tangible. Yeah, Rather exactly, than yeah. memories. Yes. Because it, it was difficult because my, my ex-wife, she was, she was supportive of it, but she, she was always like, once you've done this, just get a normal job. Just do something that's actually going to support the family. And I was like, I've got, I'm, on this, 
I'm on this road now. It's so hard to, to get away from that. And then I stopped in 2012 because I'd got hit by a car. And I was like, let's call it a day. And then 13 rolled round, or the end of 12. And I thought to myself, Glasgow Games are coming up in 2014. I, I've got enough skill and talent to still go and do it. If I don't do it, that's... I almost feel bad for the people that want to go but can't because they don't have what I've got. So if I don't use what I've got, it feels a bit of a waste. Like I've seen my, a few of my friends were really good footballers when they were young, really good. Found women, found beer, went shit. Shitty jobs, don't really you know, do what they want to do in life anymore. So I was always like, right, I'm going to go and do it. And she was fully behind it. Well, she said she was fully behind it. That's a different story. Um, so yeah then, I, yeah, so then after again, after a couple more months of training, qualified for the games, went to the games, and that was that was phenomenal. That was such an experience. You you felt like a rock star. I felt like Peter Hickman feels here for like a couple of days, which you, as you would do as as a Scottish national competitor yeah. in Scotland in the Commonwealth Games. Exactly, it's it's the perfect platform for you mm -hmm. to to show your talents off on two wheels. Yeah, and yeah, I did all right. I'd say I did all right. I didn't. I let the whole team down. It was horrendous. It was horrible. I love how you lead me into this, and then it suddenly drops away again. No, because I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm trying to stay positive. But I remember the first night. It was team sprint, and I'd been selected. And I was, I was, I knew I was all right. But I was racing with Callum Skinner. Callum Skinner went on to win gold in Rio. For, again, a phenomenal rider. And I was on his wheel, and I wasn't strong enough to get on his wheel. And I dropped off the back. And if I'd have stayed on his wheel, we probably would have got a bronze medal. So it was all down to me fucking up in front of everybody, just going out the bike like this while my teammates are going up the road. And I'm like, bye. You're not, giving me such a, you're not giving me much of a platform to keep bringing this back up every time. I'm trying to bring it up and then <laughs> it goes back down. Sorry. All right. We'll, we'll, bring, it, we'll bring it back up. Um, what was your favorite discipline, whether uh, on, on the velodrome? Oh, man. To watch or to ride? Both. Kieran. Yeah. I was really good at the Kieran, and I love the Kieran. So if people don't know what the Kieran is, it's eight laps. You sit behind a motorcycle to begin with. The motorcycle builds the speed up over six laps. It's changed now, but at five and a half laps, five and a half laps, it would come off, and then it would just be a free-for-all. And it was a free-for-all. It just started to get a little bit more well-behaved, and they were tightening up on the rules as I started, but we were still able to, to get the elbows in. And I think that's where my motorcycle experience came back, because... People were riding at 40, 50k an hour. I didn't care. I was used to doing this at Supermoto at 17, 80 miles an hour. So to me, it wasn't an issue. So I'd find these gaps that no one else could find. And, and I really enjoyed that because it was a bit more down to look and skill, less power and just overall speed. So yeah, Kieran was definitely the one. Excellent. I mean, that can be brutal. Track cycling is brutal at the best of times. There's, oh, no, yeah. there's no doubt about it. And you watch the Tour de France, the, the bunch finishes. Mm -hmm. um, with Mark Cavendish and, and uh, Andre Greipel, people like that. Yeah. They scare the, the shit out of me. But track cycling, because it's on the bank and it that resin, just, it just seems a bit more than... No, I'd take, I'd take, a, I'd take a velodrome sprint over a, rather over than the a road asphalt. sprint. Oh, you, yeah. No barriers, I suppose. No barriers, and ju the wood burn hurts. Yeah. But it doesn't hurt as much as gravel rash. Fair and news. you tend to break more bones when you're doing that, rather than, especially with those barriers at the side. We've seen some horrendous accidents when people fly over those barriers. Yeah, because the legs stick out. Yeah, I can I never yeah. quite understand that. After I watched in Manchester the other week with Scott oh, yeah, Redding yeah. was in, in, in the... At, um, at the Tour Series. In the pack, yeah. Oh, I went which, there, yeah. Which is, like, in old money, because I'm old, I remember the Kellogg City Centre Cycling that used to be on. They were massive. They yeah, were huge, huge, those races. Nottingham, Manchester, yeah. York, in Sheffield London. as well, yeah. Sheffield as well, your hometown. Yeah. Yeah, they were amazing. Not that I ever saw them, but I've seen pictures from them. Because you're the, not old enough. I'm not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> the tour series almost got there, and it was massive. And then it just petered out. And with all due respect to the riders that are there now, they're not at the level that they, they were back then. Probably even in the 80s, with the likes of Chris Walker, um, Mike, Malcolm Elliott, and people like that. Absolutely. That. Yeah. Sheffield's Malcolm Elliott. Sheffield's Michael Elliott. Uh, Sheffield's Sean Chris Yates. Walker. Shane Ye Sean Yates, yeah. There's a few, you see. Oh, yeah. I like the old cycling bit. Old and school. also, when you go over Woodhead Pass, you get to Langset. They've got the... Who um, wanna, no, but if anybody knows Woodhead Pass... <laughs> we're going we're to be really local here. Yeah, no one <laughs> in their right mind as a cyclist would go down the Woodhead Pass. The Woodhead Pass, for people that don't know, is, a, is, a, is an A road that links the top of Sheffield to Manchester. And it's the only way to get to Manchester unless you go the Snake. Yeah. 
which is a nice cycling route. It's all right. But you get HGVs and all sorts of... Sh nah, I would never ride not a bike. Not for me, that. Not a chance. No. Not for me. I don't like hills anyway. I, I was <laughs> born and bred in Lincolnshire and then moved to Lancashire. The flattest of the flats. The, the flattest of the flat to living on a hill. Yeah. Which is, but coming from Sheffield, seven hills, you know, you could, you, that's why a bit we, of training on there. That's why we make such good cyclists. Yeah. Yeah. Getting really out into the cyclists. Peak District is great. Yeah. You can't go out my door without going up or down a hill, so... You learn to love I, them. I know that feeling. <laughs> I never know which, never know whether to turn left or right. Usually it's right, and then I'll come up the hill on the, yeah. on, on the way back. So how did you end up here doing this at the TT? I know we've not got the best of weather this afternoon. We've had a glorious fortnight so far. Tell us how you ended up on TT+. What, Plus what time is it? Because it's a long story. Two minutes past three. Is that all? Yeah. See, this is the problem. When I'm down on that fan part, right, I'm doing these chats, and it feels like I'm chatting for an hour. And I look at my watch, and I've been chatting for five minutes, and I'm like, I've run out of questions here. I have no idea where I'm going to take this now, but I need to just try and extend it. You've got somebody back, like the old TV thing, they're behind you going. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did, anybody, did anybody down here see the uh, prize presentation on, was it Wednesday night? I can't remember. Prize presentation when they give the, the awards out to the riders. There's silver and bronze records yeah, yeah, yeah. and what have you, yeah. I'm hosting it. Uh, it's a bit of a somber start, because obviously we have to recognize the, the the people that we've lost and the people that are injured. We got through that fine, and that was really important. But then we started the prize presentation, and I had to welcome on the stage Philip McCallan. Everybody goes wild, woo, Philip McCallan. Turn around, no one there. <laughs> All right. Is Philip there? No. At no point did anybody think, let's make sure we got Phil here before we start this show. No. So I, I ended up getting John Holden, the, the sidecar driver. He came up and ended up giving up the prizes. And then Philip just turned up on stage randomly halfway through it. I'm like, you're right, Phil. And he's like, yeah. And he's just stood there. I'm like, I don't need you anymore, mate. Go on. And he's like, oh, OK. And then Bless just walked him. off. Bless him. What an absolute legend so of the sport to, as Yeah, well. so I had to pad for a good five minutes. It was embarrassing. Mate, it's all experience. Well, yeah, I know. I thought, if I can get through that, I can just about get through anything. Sorry, I digress. Okay, you got the whole audience going, talk to me. Yeah, yeah. And do you <laughs> know what that is? <laughs> God, I'm not comfortable horrible. with these six people here looking <laughs> yeah. at it. It's the biggest a, audience we've ever had. There was a good, <laughs> there was a good five, 500 people maybe there. Anyway, we got through it. That's the main thing. We got through it. But how I ended up here was, again, long story, and it, it stems back to cycling. So Paul Phillips, the organizer of the TT, everybody knows him. He organized a a thing called Cycle Fest on the island, which was like a two or three day festival for cyclists. There'd be a big sportive during it, amongst other little rides and, and a, a massive, it was up at Milntown, a big concert and it was amazing. And I worked for a company called the Bike Channel. Uh, it was a 24 hour, seven days a week cycling channel. How they ever thought that was gonna last, I have no idea, but it, they just repeated everything. So you'd see my face on it like five times in the space of a couple of hours. So, um, but the only reason I got that was because they'd, sorry guys, if this is boring, I'm so sorry, but I'm just trying to I'm give you context. I'm fascinated, I'm the host, you, I'm so giving it doesn't you matter. Context. <laughs> I asked the question. There was a, they, were, they were starting a program where they were looking for the next big cyclist, a bit like the X Factor, but for cycling. But they wanted cyclists to send in videos. Now, I don't know if you know many cyclists, but similar to motorcyclists, not, not all of them, some of them, don't have the greatest of personalities. No. I mean, once, really? you get, but once you get to know them, some are really nice. On camera, they're completely different, but do you know what I mean? Let me just say that. So I was thinking, how on earth are they going to get these cyclists? Anyway, I thought instead of auditioning for a cyclist, I'd just send them an audition tape saying, listen, if you've not got a presenter for it, I'd love to do it. And they said, well, we've got a presenter for it. Brian Smith's doing it. Rob Hales is doing it. But we'll keep you on, 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 um, on the back burner if anything comes up. This thing came up for these sportives where they'd go and present sportives around the country, one of them being Cycle Fest. So I ended up going, we presented this thing, and then I ended up interviewing Paul. No idea that he was the, the, the TT organizer, didn't have a clue. Interviewed him, talked about Cycle Fest, left. A year later, I start working for RST um, in their social media side, doing videos, photographs, things like that. Come back over the t to the TT to do some social, and Johnny Towers, the owner of RST, is sat chatting to Paul. And I walk up to them, say hi to Johnny, look at Paul, and I'm like, aren't you the guy that organizes Cycle Fest? He's like, hiya, Chris. I was just telling Johnny what a good job you did on the, on the presenting. I was like, oh, mega. So then we kind of got chatting. We stayed in touch. And since then, I've nagged him pretty much every single year saying, 
I don't know how you do it, Paul, but just speak to ITV and let me present. I'm dying to present. I want to present the, the TT. That is the ultimate goal, to get on, to, to steal Matt Roberts' job. Isn't that, that's my, that's my goal. Yeah, it's right, gotta be. get in line. It's got to be, I am. I get feel, in line. I feel that now. Okay. <laughs> I feel it now. <laughs> I've been trying to, I've been here too long. I've been trying too hard. <laughs> too invested <laughs> in this in now. Line. Yeah, but we did, somehow we need to kill him off. I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe poison, I don't know. I'll hold him, you just you cuff him and then Douglas Harbour never to be seen again. Weight down. Yeah. Weight his legs down. Oh, he's going to float otherwise, isn't he? That's yeah. That like, defeats the object. We could, uh, we'll work on this. I think that's a good idea. He's going yeah. to Mizano. Just cancel his flights. We could do that. He's going to Mizano tomorrow, uh, tomorrow no, night. Yes, no, send him out and then cancel his flight so yeah. he's stuck there. He's got to walk home. Yes, but he'll walk home. By the time he gets home, it'll be TT again. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, so he'll just walk straight back here but he is and also, go again. He is also TV's Matt Roberts, so somebody will, you know, he'll be in Johnny Ray's private jet or Shaky yeah. will go and fetch him in a helicopter. You know, he has, he has connections. God damn him. I know. And he's good at his job, so... He really is good yeah, at his job. Which is really annoying. I'd Very love to say he's great hair as well. Lovely. I have hair. a bit of a man crush on him. Yeah, I can see why. I do. Yeah. I have for a while. And then he becomes a friend and then it just gets a bit awkward. Okay. But anyway, uh, carry on your story. Sorry. <laughs> I've completely <laughs> lost my story now. <laughs> so What time did you have to be at the fan park? Talking to Paul. <laughs> and then so yeah, and then I saw Paul at the NEC and he gave me his card and I've still got it in my wallet now. And he was like, We'll sort something, we'll sort something. And then in 2020, he phoned up and he said, we want to do this fan part. This is the idea, and we think you'd be great for it. Will you do it? Absolutely. It's my first kind of job with the TT. Obviously, the TT got cancelled. We moved on a few years. Then the guys decided they wanted a podcast, and again, they said, please host it. I'll, no, I'm all right. Thanks, lads. Which is really good. Please plug it. TT podcast. It's uh, daily at the minute. You can get it on Spotify, iTunes, and other Spotify, Spotify and pop, pop, Wherever pop. you get your podcasts from. Pod apps. I was told to say pod apps. Pod apps? Pod apps. That's, that's, not, really, that's not really easy to say, is it? Pod apps, no. <laughs> but that's what they told me to say. Modern day social media. I know. Anyway. It's beyond me. It's, it's daily at the minute, and then we've got a podcast coming out in two weeks with the senior winner, and then... I think Which we're going to have one with... <sighs> Who do I... Th what does this... My heart say, or what does my head say? Both. My head says Pete. My heart says David Todd. Perfect. I'll go with that. Yeah. I'd and then Dean somewhere in the middle and Mickey D as well. And That's the problem. You've you got, just go through you've and got you go, too yeah, many, that. aren't you? Yeah. But in my, if, if, if it's my heart's choice, Davey. He's going to win one eventually. Of course he is. But 100%. I'd, I'd like to be here when he does it because it would be a special moment. It was special enough on Monday, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. The it that was Especially with Connor. The, the best way is, is we're digressing and all of it. But that, Sorry. The, the, no, no, not at all. That's... The overwhelming theme of, of doing these podcasts over the last couple of weeks, it's been the emotion of the event. And you only experience that by being here. So we've, we've kind of got the gist how you got, because I'm, I'm conscious of time for you because you've got to be somewhere else in 20 minutes. Popular guy. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and rightly so. You, your face is everywhere. It's on so the TV. Someone else, it's someone on else said that, and I was like, people are probably getting annoyed at me right it's now. It's like in programs and billboards. and. I did get called a prat on stage as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? Conrad Harrison, just out of nowhere. That's not a sh that's not a shock. <laughs> that's <laughs> Conrad. All oh, right, okay, fair. Because <laughs> he said, because I was asking the questions for the top three riders, like, and I, listen, I've asked those guys questions so many times this week. I was like, just ask them something completely different. So I asked Pete, Netflix and chill, or a night out with the boys, and then I was asking Dean something else, and then Conrad came on, and wherever he had finished, he'd not finished in the top three, but he said, are you going to ask me a question? I said, yeah. I said, how do you think your Dean's going to get on in the senior? Lovely question. Great opportunity for him to say, I'd love to see him win. So proud of my son. He went, I'm not answering that. You're a prat. And walked off. <laughs> I was like, I said, uh, 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 uh. Had you met Conrad prior to this? No. <laughs> that probably explains it. He is the most <laughs> unique man that you will ever meet. Yeah. Oh, I'm not answering that question, you pillock. And then you'd be walking away in that bit and you go, pretty much. Waving Sorry, to the, Conrad. Waving to the crowd. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck. Your sidecar's over there, mate. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. fine. I mean, I, yeah, a little bit, but... Proper postman. He's great. Yeah. You get to know him, he's a good bloke. Yeah, I'm sure he... Uh, hey, listen, if... But first impressions are yeah. there. Cheers. Because, yeah, Dean's a, Dean's a wonderful man, so... Yeah. yeah, if he's come from from that stock, then I'm sure Conrad is all right. He, he might have just had a drink or two. It, it's a possibility. Yeah. They do like the Thursday night <laughs> drinkies club. They <laughs> yeah. do like a bit of that. 
how have you found the, the TT for the last couple of weeks? Is your is it your first experience here? No, I've been, been so I came as a in punter? 2017 and 18 working for RST. Oh, okay. So I came out the day after uh, Dan Neen got killed, uh, which was again working for RST. It was it, I never got to meet him properly. And I'm really disappointed about that because he was such a good guy. And I was following Lee Johnston and Ian Hutchinson when they were riding for the Honda factory team. And I was doing a mini documentary thing of for RST. And it never got to see Light of Day, unfortunately. Um, and I kept seeing Dean, uh, sorry, Dan. I kept seeing Dan at, what's the track in Wales where they always go and test? The track in Wales? Yeah. Oh, what's it called now? Not Landau. No. Anglesey. No. Well, that's the only one that's in Wales. Down south. Yeah. You going with really the bumpy. Um, Castle Coombe. Castle Coombe. In it's Wiltshire. Not in, it's not in Wales, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's close enough. It's the Dunlop tyre test. Yeah, it's close enough, right? It's that way on. For us, it's close enough. It may as well be Wales. It might as well be. Yeah, as soon as I leave my door and I'm out of Yorkshire, anything could be anywhere. <laughs> Castle Coombe, down south somewhere, right? So there we are. Uh, we test in and I'm filming them and then Connor turns up he's doing a bit of testing and filming him and then Dan comes and we keep, we keep like seeing each other and saying let's do something let's do something and then unfortunately I never I never got a chance to do that with him because yeah I think he would have been really yeah he was, a, he was an amazing guy um, so it was hard to come out and work for RST and that be my first experience obviously people you know their experiences of it would have been hell of a lot worse than mine I understand that but it was it was strange but then I had a, I spoke to Lee the day after in his camper and he's like, I've known that guy for so long and it was obviously tragic what happened, but he says, in 10 minutes time, I've got to go out there and I've got to put my helmet on and I've got to put it to one side and forget about it and just go. And it's amazing how the, the boys and girls can do that. Um, so this year has been strange, stressful, amazing, heartbreaking but ultimately like a, an experience you will never forget and that's the TT in a nutshell isn't it? it's you can't put it into words you can't try and explain it to somebody else who's never been here and you are just like this and what makes it harder for me or not harder but what I see more is what goes on with Paul and what goes on with the team and what they do in there is unbelievable like they have got such a hard job to do what they do without the hassle of other people kind of chipping in and getting on their old keyboards and saying you know why is practice cancelled what's happening here blah 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 they're, they're running such a, a tight ship and it's so it must be so stressful for them and I've kind of felt it a little bit because I've been in there and I've seen it but then on the other hand we're giving away awards and we're having prize presentations and we're interviewing the riders when they're at their, their height of emotion because they've just come off the track and they've just won a race or they've just got a podium so it's yeah it's been really difficult but I've loved every minute of it and you've absolutely summed up the essence of the TT there oh I hope so it, it absolutely I feel the same we my sure the listeners to the, the show will be sick of hearing this they know my first experience of the TT was 2018 the Wednesday night that we lost Dan mm -hmm. so we came over here we sat at Braddon literally off the jet straight to Braddon watched the boys go past once red flag had no idea the um, the feeling behind the red flag because we only ever watched it on the TV or listened on the radio yeah through working back in manufacturing came up to the paddocks or a couple of friends up here and it you, all of a sudden you kind of it clicked and you suddenly go ah we mm -hmm. don't need to be here yeah we yeah. need to go back to the digs and we'd seen a friend of ours and he'd, ex he'd explained the ethos behind what had happened not what had happened yeah. but the fact that something had yeah so I, I said to my girlfriend i said jennifer come on we need to go i don't want to be here but that was my first feeling of the TT mm -hmm. but then to stand up on the grid on the Friday night and you're watching Andy Daly and Josh Daly Andy's patting Josh on the back they swap the helmet and the hat yeah and they go off and the 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 emotion we're gonna have TT blues for a week when we finish here because it's just you live and breathe it for 24 7 you do and it, it, it and I'm sure that the guys here all feel the same it's why they're here yeah because you can't explain it nobody can you can try mm -hmm. but it just doesn't quite work so what, what's been the highlight for you I've, in all the build-up and the videos that you've done and the, the the 
stars that you've spoken to? Ooh. What's been your highlight? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Can we cu- can we cut this out so it's a lot shorter of a pause, <laughs> and then I can just come in with like an answer. Boom. Talk to the boys there. They can, <laughs> they're in charge. Um, <laughs> they're in charge of the edit. Oh man. <laughs> um, Leave it in. I've I've really enjoyed interviewing the guys on the podium. Seeing Paul Jordan on the podium, that was a highlight. Seeing Lee on the podium was a highlight because he's a he's a he's a good friend. Um, I don't know. I think the highlight is yet to come. That's a great answer. Yeah. Because we're not over yet. No. You've got a very busy day tomorrow, though, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Yes, extremely. I mean, you say me. Not really. It's pretty easy. I tell everybody that the live stream's coming on. Live stream starts. The boys do what they do best. And then I just interview them. And it's great because, like I said, the race has just finished. So all the knowledge is in my head. So I sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's half the battle. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's the only reason I'm sat here. So then I do I my quick... I kind of know what I'm talking right, about. Right, how many, how many TTs has he now won right? So Hickey's up to nine, David Todd's second pole, blah, blah, blah. So then I just reel off them facts, and like all the fan part go, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. We really, no the, the, Chris, the Chris Pritchard fan club is growing. It is, isn't it? I think so. It's so big down there. Even more so now you've been on a proper podcast. They're going to change the name to the fan part, to the Chris Pritchard fan part next I think year. that's great. They should do It's that. almost like a tribute already. Well, yeah, because you've done so well this first two weeks. All right, thanks. Do you think that's how it should be? Never mind the monster fan, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a point where, over the last uh, sort of couple of weeks, you, you've gone to ask a question and you've not got the answer you were expecting? Have you been thrown at any point? Because riders sometimes are very good at that. No, that's good. Michael, I think he didn't understand my question when I asked him, "Do you prefer cats or dogs?" I don't think he got it. <laughs> Again, another moment on stage where I was completely embarrassed. But we live and learn. Why that question? Again, I'd asked. He'd, so he'd been on the podium for the Superbike race, uh, the Super Sport race, and I think I'd interviewed him somewhere else. I'm just sick. Of, not that I'm sick of asking the same question, because that's wrong, but the boys are sick of asking the same question, and I don't want the same generic answer that they've asked everybody else. So, you know, we only had, I only literally had one question to ask them. Why ask him, how was the race? The race was two days ago. Oh, it was all right. What are you going to do next? Oh, I'm just going to carry on going faster. Brilliant. Make a few changes, go again. Exactly, Chip, yeah. Chipping away. So chipping let's away. see what happens when we say cats or dogs. Even if he just goes, do you know what? I love cats. Mega. Something that somebody didn't know. Exactly, yeah. What's your favourite cheese? Grated. Simple as that. Oof, yeah. <laughs> I think that was a Stephen Gerrard one, I think, that one. But the quick fire <laughs> question ones, they're quite cool because they're not That's used to mega. that, are they? They're used yeah, to exactly, yeah. generic sort of Matt Roberts questions where the easy answers, like, yeah. I'll, I'll build your part up there so you can be I, better to, to be fair, I'm not sure Matt if Roberts. I'm made for TV on the, on the TT. Yeah, because Matt does that job so well and he asks the right questions. I'll be asking stupid questions up on that grid. Like, but why not? That, that opens up a whole new audience. Yeah, but, well, I suppose, but do the riders really want to be answering those stupid questions when they're on the yes, start Yes, because it'll relax them. Maybe. And they'll be going off down Glen Crutchy Road going, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that so might not be So they're all relaxed now, you see? Then they're well, heading off down to St. Ninian's and they've got you in their mind. We might not see, oh, God. We might not see close racing, though, because they might be so chilled, they'll be like, oh, do you know what? We'll just enjoy this ride. Or what if they give the wrong answer? Damn, why did I say that? It stopped. Turn it stopped around. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a breakdown there, <laughs> Pete? No, I, need, I just needed to come back to tell Chris. I meant dogs, not cats. <laughs> what does the future hold for you, mate? What, what, what do we do going forward Who from after, after TT week? Where, after TT not. fortnight, where I mean, do you go? Next week, I'm off to Austria. Okay. To do a bit more presenting for the Global Cycling Network. Ooh, Excellent. Yeah. So Very I'm looking good. forward to that. Paid gig? Oh, hell yeah. Excellent. Good. Yeah. That's a good start. Um, but in terms of what, I don't know, who knows? The podcast is, is going from strength to strength. How it's going to go after the, the TT, we're still going to get people who still want that buzz of that TT. So hopefully that'll keep growing and take us through to next year. Maybe they'll invite me back next year. I really hope so. But I, if, it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't. It really no, wouldn't. You haven't given them reason not to yet, have you? I think I have. I think I've given plenty of reasons. <laughs> if the bosses are watching that fan park, I've given them more than enough reasons to well, never have it back. Most people in the fan park have had a few beers, so they're, they're, they're up for it, and it's, now it's fine. Okay. You'll right, be well, ma- with that. Maybe I will be back next year. But I'd, I'd like you to do it, because I don't want them to ask me to do it. It's good fun. I'm sure it is. You can literally say anything you want. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is why they put me there and not on TV. <laughs> Who's your favourite racer? I've got a real man crush on Davy Todd. Haven't we? He's all? an ex-supermoto rider. I like to think that he watched me when I was supermoto racing. That's where he got his inspiration from. And that's why he's so good. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that, especially with the facial hair as well. He's growing the beard out mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. And the hair's coming the same way. Yeah. And he wants to be Chris Pritchard when he grows up. I think he does. I think that's a great way yeah. to finish. In fact, no, let's do two more questions. Oh, okay. Because you might have the answers to these or not. I've, you've listened to the podcast. You know what the last two questions are. You've done some racing in your time. What's your favorite corner and why? Mm, I really like Craner Curves for obvious reasons. Um, and I like, is it Gerrard's at Mallory? Yeah. I like Gerrard's because it's a nice fast one. Uh, but I went to Portimao and, I ra and I, that's where the first ever time I rode a 1,000cc bike. Great place to do it. And I shit my pants because it drops off the hill. And I went off the hill on, a, on this blade, and for the first time I was doing 180 mile an hour instead of like one, what does my 600 do? One, 30. No, it's an S Rad. Oh, yes, right. It's an S from 1999. Yeah. <laughs> it does a, yeah, it maybe it does one, 130, so I know exactly what it's going to do. But on the brakes, it felt like the back end had come up, and then you drop off that cliff. I thought I'd just flipped the whole thing. I thought Into the back turn end. One. Yeah, I thought the back end was up there like that, but no. So, um, what is it? It goes. Is it Craig Jones's? Yes. I think that one yeah, that Jones goes up that yeah. hill into that blind uh, right hander. I mean, the bl blind right hander is horrible, but that that's that coming onto it because you drop off that waterfall thing into that fast left. That's that was yeah. I'd you say didn't that quite one. do the Jack Miller where you could get the bunny hop. And no. No, I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> do you still follow old BSB MotoGP World oh, yeah, Superbikes? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quattararo is going to win the championship again after I didn't think he was going to. No, he's but, not. But he's not. Who's going to win it? Peko. Not a chance. Every chance. My boy is going to win the MotoGP championship. He's just, sandbagging. I was just... He's not sandbagging. <laughs> he's crashing at every opportunity he can get. It's 21 rounds. It's well, 20 rounds. I don't think they're doing the Kimi ring now, are they? So No. But he's just leaving it to li like he did last year till the very last minute and then he's just going to smash it all and just and they go ciao bella so what about the breaking news about ktm uh, signing uh, jack miller i think that's a great shout for them yeah who's he replacing um who's there binder's there binder's staying so he's replacing Oliveira. the dentist yeah mm. yeah he's going back to get a proper job i think he might need to yeah I think that's a good move for him. It's played with Danny Pedroza. Well, going back to being a dentist? He's probably. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the, the field now and you see more Bedelli where amazing, he is and, oh and God. Um, Maverick Vinal is still struggling. Yeah. It's like, there's a huge amount of talent at that bottom end. But I think for Jack, along if uh, Danny Pedroza stays or if he's done his time in developing the KTM, Jack Miller's absolutely the next best thing. Yeah. But then who replaces Jack? Is it Bastianini or is it going to be Jorge Martin? <laughs> Yeah, Bastianini, I'm going to guess. But is everyone on the same contract? Is everybody on the same contract? Uh, I think now everybody's in the same cycle. So yeah, it's the so same two, two years. years. So yeah. By the time we get to Brno and places like so that, it's going to be like musical it. chairs then. Absolutely. Who's going to take the Honda ride off of Espagaro? Because he's not going to be on Mir. that. Oh, yeah. Good shout. Yeah. I have a very strong feeling it's going to be Joanne Mir. And then, new, and then two Aprilias are coming in, right? Yeah. Which are taking over the... The, the Suzuki, factory, the uh, satellite at Yamaha's. Oh, are they? They're going to be the two Aprilias. The so, R so we're not replacing the Suzukis with anything. And I thought that that's where that that team was coming in from. Which it effectively is, but it's the um, the old Petronas team. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, going yeah. Going to Aprilia because yeah, they went. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, but it's not been the most exciting. It's not been BSB, has it? No, or World Superbikes. No, 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 no. World Superbikes have been great. It's been. It's who's been your, nice. Who's nice your favourite there? Who do you want to win there? <sighs> I love uh, I love Jonathan Ray, but he did make it boring. Sorry, Jonathan, but he did make it boring. He was did too good. But now you've got Top Rack and you've got um, Alvaro Bautista. Bautista back on the Ducati. I'd like to have seen Scott be up there a bit more, going for the championship, but not on a BMW. Not on a BMW. Not Unfortunately, a no, not at all. But it's good racing. It is. They thoroughly enjoy it. It's, it's two wheels, isn't it? Exactly. That's a good thing. And the Tour de France starts soon as well, which is going to be great yes. to watch. We always enjoy watching that. Um, final question: What's your best hire car story? I'm not. A, I'm not that kind of a racer, so I don't well, have you one. A, you can have one anytime you like. Um, I haven't even got one. It doesn't matter. It's no problem. Just trying to think of any good story that I can fill in a car. 
Oof. <laughs> it starts in the car, but always ends out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> There's just not enough room in a car. Especially my mum's Micra. Oh, yeah. You, That's uh, what I used to uh, drive what, around six in. Spot the in the <laughs> Micra. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's let's end with a different question then. What's been your most embarrassing moment while you've been presenting these last two weeks? Remember that story I told you about Philip McKellen? That'd be the one. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I tell you what, I'm watching the time. It's nearly half past. Chris Pritchard, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm not sure it has, but thank you. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> has. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Pritchard. You get paid to do that.